like I said this morning, I want to continue. Uh, I just want to share something else here first. Exodus chapter 19. Uh, there's a, a scripture that we often see quoted and you see down the plaque. It's out of Isaiah uh, 40, I believe. And it says, uh, They that wait upon the Lord, they'll renew their strength. They'll rise up on wings like eagles and they'll walk in that faint and they'll run in the back of the And You know, it's a nice scripture to put on a plaque encouraging but we have to get a hold of it and understand what it means in our lives because it's not just a nice thing that God says he's not just using some comparisons and, and to make it sound good it's not written for a piece of literature it's written for a purpose because God will work this way in us and believe amen if you turn with me to Exodus 19 I want to I want to see the the embodiment of it, so to speak. Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children, now Exodus means exit, right? This is when God brought Israel out of Egypt. That was the Exodus. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day they came into the wilderness of uh, Sinai. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mountain. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the, unto the Egyptians. We saw what God did, meaning what? Many went, meaning when God parted the Red Sea, Israel went through on dry land, but when Egypt was coming to destroy them, God allowed the waters to overcome them and drown them. God destroyed. Pretty much God said, you saw how, number one, I protected you and delivered you from your enemies, and number two, how I destroyed your enemies, and how God brought them through in providing and taking care of them and leading them with a pillar of fire and a cloud, how God directed Now listen. God said, tell the people this. You saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. See, this is the, this is the enactment of when God says, those that wait on me, right? They'll mount up like wings. That means God will draw you unto himself. God will bear you up and God will hold you. God will support you. How he said, how I bear you on eagles' wings and I brought you unto myself. And this is what God will do, is those that wait on the Lord. God will do that. This is what it means, you know, mount up like wings on eagles, meaning God is going to draw you unto himself. He's going to support you. He's going to be with you. He's going to defend you. So wait on the Lord in all of your things, and God will give victory. Wait on, your, wait on the Lord in all of your dealings, and God will give you victory. Amen? Praise God. That's his will is to strengthen us that way and to be, to draw us unto himself. Amen? Hope you're encouraged by that. Amen. First Thessalonians, I'm going to share another scripture here before I get started as part of. First Thessalonians chapter 3. If you have your Bible, follow along. I know it's great that we have this up here. Oh, look at now you got to follow up. It's, it's so important that we learn to navigate. And when you see it with your own eyes and you're reading it, you're navigating, you can mark it in your Bible. It means something to you. 
it's so important that we learn to navigate through our Bibles. The first Timothy chapter three says, Where, First Thessalonians, yep. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. And we sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you. Now we're talking about the righteous. God will not suffer the righteous to be moved. He wants to establish us. Amen? To establish you uh, in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. What he's talking about is, in Christianity, we are appointed to trials and tribulations. We are appointed to hardships. We are appointed to afflictions. We are appointed to, to burdens. We are appointed to these things. Because God uses these things to refine us and to identify us and to shape us and to mold us, to make us and to teach us. Amen. So he said, I don't want any, I want you to, number one, I want you to be established in Christ. We're sending Timothy to establish you in the things of God, to establish you in your faith, so that nobody is moved by these afflictions. The things that we see, this is the problem that we see. Trials happen, temptations come, uh, tribulations come, hardships come, but people, and people are being moved because we're not established. We need to be established. And Paul says this, I'm sending Timothy uh, to, in, to, uh, in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. That no man should be moved by these afflictions, for you know yourselves that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we are with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He said, I sent Timothy. I wanted to see your condition. I wanted to make sure you're encouraged in the faith because I know the enemy's going through the camp trying to tempt people and discourage them and get them to go shipwreck in their faith. Get them to be moved away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that's happening. Gina was just telling me. What law? Mariah, they, they had some pastor come. I don't know what he's standing for, but so the pastor come and preach on, on, the, on the camp, the base. And he was a man 20 years that served the Lord. And then he turned away from God and spent a year preaching to deny God. And Moriah and this guy came and preached on base, tried to deny and denounce God. He was moved away somewhere. I guarantee you something happened in his life that moved him away from the gospel. The enemy came, the tempter came, and he was able to be moved because he had a door that was opened. If it was lust, if he was just uh, negligent in his spiritual man, if he was after something else, and he lost his way with God. He was not established. The tempter came through the camp, and he was plucked out. That's how it can happen. And, and, and he said, I sent Timothy so that we might know your condition, so that our labor is not in vain. I'm not working this hard. I'm not praying. I'm not putting my life at risk every day from being chased down by the enemy and, and being threatened by the enemy in prison. I'm not doing this in vain. I want to know that you're walking with God properly. This is what he's saying. This will come to our country as well. This will. We have to know that we're established in our faith. Amen? That we know God, that we walk with God the right way. I guarantee you the churches in Europe, I hope with all my heart, I hope with all my heart, the churches in Europe, the Christians there are saying, we didn't preach hard enough, we didn't preach loud enough, we didn't pray hard enough, we didn't evangelize, we were so consumed with our entertainment, we were so consumed with our pleasure, and now we're enslaved by the Muslims. That's what's happening in France. Make no mistake. It's the same trap is being set up in America. Exact same trap is being set up in America. Guys, God wants us to be ready. God wants us to be a people that are prepared. Amen. So let's go. Uh, we're going we're gonna to continue on in Psalm 55, verse 22. Again, the scripture is three parts. Cast your 
Cast your burdens on the Lord, number one, and he shall sustain thee, number two. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. We don't want to be a people that are moved. We want to be a people strong and sturdy and steady, a solid oak. Amen? But we got to go back to the first part. How do we get there? We cast our burdens on the Lord. We talked about that last week. We talked about prayer. Uh, God wants us to change the dynamics of our prayer life. He doesn't want us to be uh, praying sleepy prayers. He doesn't want us to be praying lukewarm prayers. But he wants us to press in. And we, I shared some scripture about how Jesus was in the garden. And, and being in agony, he prayed. And he sweat as it were drops of blood. He labored in prayer. He labored to the point that he, because he was overcoming the will of, of his own flesh as a man, as surrendering to the will of the Father, he prayed earnestly as it were. He told the disciples at that, t at that time again, pray that you enter not into t temptation. Why are you sleeping? He came and found them sleeping. Why are you sleeping? Pray that you enter not into temptation. The angel of God comes from heaven and strengthens him. And he prays even more earnestly. Father, if it's possible. And there's an agony. There's a battle. And there's something going on in the garden there. Because he had to overcome the will of man. And I'm telling you, every one of us, it's the same thing. We all have something to overcome. And, and things that will come our way that we have to walk in the spirit and, and overcome all the flesh. Amen? There's another scripture in Hebrews that says, In the times of his flesh he offered up strong tears, uh, strong crying and tears before the Father. And my prayer is, God, bring us to the realization how empty or how cold or how complacent or how lukewarm we are that, that we're brought to tears. God, forgive us. God, wash us. God, I set my heart on fire. And we get a, an anguish about us that says, God, I can't go on this way anymore, but God, I need victory. Lord, be my help. Lord, deliver me from this, or deliver me from this. Or God, bring me victory. Touch my body. Give me healing, Lord. And there's a certain dynamic and attitude that we need to have in prayer for God to hear us. Some people won't agree with that, and that's okay. But I'm saying... As many people as were around Jesus, only one person got touched. And that was the woman that came with the determination. That was the woman that came with the purpose. She wasn't hanging out. She wasn't there to hear something new. She was there to get touched by Jesus. She came with a different dynamic in her purpose, and the power of God touched her. And you, the same thing will happen to you and I. When we come before God this way, we don't serve a dead God. We come when we bring ourselves before Him and cry out, and I'm not saying you have to be loud and boisterous like me. I'm not, I'm not trying to make copycats. I just want the sincerity. God's looking for the sincerity in our prayer life. Amen? And sometimes it's anguish. And sometimes you cry out. You have to. If you don't, something's not right. Pour it all out before God. Pour your heart out before Him. Because God will be our help in time of need. Amen? <clears throat> anyway, um, Let's go to, uh, I'm going to change course here a minute. Turn with me, because I want to show you something here. I, I've talked about it many times, but I want to prove it. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Verse 1. It came to pass when Jesus made an end of commanding his 12 disciples... Then he departed uh, to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. John had heard about the miracle that Jesus was doing. He was going out healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. These are the works of Christ. These are the works that God wants to do in us as well, right? And through us. He sent two of his disciples and said to them, Are you the... Are you he that should come, or should we look for another? He's asking the question, are you the Messiah, or are we waiting for somebody else? Look at how Jesus answers him. He didn't say, yep, I'm the one. 
I am he. He didn't say that. He didn't answer that way. Here's what he said. Go and tell John this. Go and show John again those things which you do here and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whoever shall not be offended in me. Almost as if he's asking, bringing the question back on John. Am I the one? And the evidence is there to support that he is, right? So he tells John this, this is what's happening. And as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what went you out to see in the wilderness? What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Because John was not shaken. John was not moved. John was a man that was solid and established before God. And when he went out into the communities, he was solid and established. No matter what men were doing around him, he was solid and established as a man of God, as we should be. What did you go out to see in the, uh, in the wilderness? A reed shaking with the wind? But what, what went you out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? A man dressed in a you know, $1,500 Armani suit, however much they cost? Right? Yeah, I'm talking about the TV preachers and these guys that are have million dollar homes and you know two hundred fifty thousand dollar cars and they have all their suits and all these things. What went you out to see? A man dressed so nice? No. You find them in king's palaces, is what Jesus said to them. You find those, those they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What went you out to see? A prophet? But yea, I say unto you, more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them born of women, there are there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is in that is least in the kingdom of God is still greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a great man. One of the greatest men on earth, right? Yep. But in the kingdom of God, he is the least. So we have a picture of this man that is strong. We have a picture of this man that is humble. He's not all decorated in fine clothes like we are. He's not a man that is uh, uh, some great spectacle in the flesh. He's a man that's established in the things of God. And so Jesus is making a comparison. And it's at verse, uh, verse 12 says this, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. I've talked about the scripture a lot. I don't know that I've ever addressed it this way. But the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. What does that mean to you and I? Violence, isn't that evil? Isn't that negative? It's not talking about it in that context. That context means aggression. That context means coming earnestly. Uh, in verse, again, in verse 12, that word violence means to be seized, getting a hold of. The kingdom of heaven allows us to, remember what Jesus said, suffer the little children, allow the little children to come up to me. In the same way, the kingdom of heaven allows itself to be seized. It allows us to get a hold of the kingdom of heaven. It's, a, it's a, another um, word for it is to crowd ourselves into it. The kingdom of heaven allows us to be crowded, us to crowd ourselves into it. Uh, it, it allows that, and that's what it means, that word uh, violence. And the violent take it by force. That means to seize it again. We get a hold of it. So when we get before God, we, we push our way. Lord, I need you. God, give me victory. All right? I'm talking about our prayer lives because this talks about our prayer life. The kingdom of heaven allows you to come this way with boldness and with courage. Yeah, I know my condition, but God, you know it too. I need you, Lord. Give me victory, Lord. And you come before the Lord in that way, in, in, in that aggression, in that that uh, that almost hostile, but in a good hostile. Lord, I need you. Right? No? 
I hope you're getting on fire. I hope you're getting on fire with this. I hope you're feeding off of this, right? Because in our prayer life, God wants to do something. God wants to move. Every one of us draws closer to him. So um, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Uh, and that is speaking of us. Let's come before God this way. Now, go with me uh, again to uh, Luke chapter 8. There was a woman outside the crowd that had an issue for 12 years. She had an issue of blood. It was a disease. It was a plague. It was something that plagued her. She spent all of her money on the doctors and they couldn't do anything and, they don't, and, and she only grew worse. Right? She only grew worse. This is a woman that had no hope in the flesh. Uh, this is what the scripture talks about, trusting in horses and trusting in chariots. It's talking about the strength of man or strength in the flesh. Right? But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. So this woman in Luke, issue of blood 12 years, spent all her living. She had a disease. She had a plague. I, I, I want us to be so minded that no matter what I have, it's a disease, it's a plague. So what? It's cancer. So what? Nothing's too difficult for the Lord. Right? Because sometimes we get that big word, cancer. Oh. Like this is it. It's over. It's not over until God says it's over. Right? I don't want to be moved by that word. I don't want to be moved by a financial a bill that comes in the middle. I don't want to be moved by a health report. I don't want to be moved by what's going on in the world. I'm not going to be shaken. I'm not going to be a reed shaken in the wind. We want to be established, right? This woman comes before the Lord, has an issue of blood, spent all her living on the physicians, neither could any healer. She came in behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stopped. It dried up immediately. Now, we know that she's, uh, Jesus is surrounded by a group of people. And we know that she had to make her way through that crowd. I talk about this a lot. There's something really special about this woman in this testimony. She had to push her way through the, the crowd of people, get a few people out of the way. So that's the violence. That's the aggression. That's the determination that she's wanting to get a touch from the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven allows that. Push your way through the crowd. Get out of my way. I need to touch Jesus. I don't care what these people think. I need to touch Jesus. Right? This has to be our mindset when we come to prayer. And Jesus looked around and said, Who touched me? And everybody denied. And Peter that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng you and press against you. They're pressing up against you. It's a, a, a thick crowd here. And you say, who touched me? Jesus said, somebody has touched me, for I perceive that virtue or power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling, falling down before him, and she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her daughter, Be of good comfort. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. This is it, personified. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Of all the people that were standing around the kingdom of heaven, and I'm speaking of Jesus, one person took it by force. One person had the courage to push everybody out of the way, make her way through the crowd, and say, If I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. And she did. So well, how can that change your prayer life? How can that change your attitude and your mindset when you go before the Lord and you cast your cares on Him? That's the first part of the scripture. Psalm 55. Cast your burdens on the Lord and He will sustain you. Amen? When we pray, let's pray this way. Alright. Back on course. Psalm 55 verse 22. Cast your burdens on the Lord and He shall sustain you. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Turn with me to Genesis 32. We're going to look at He shall sustain you. Casting your tears on the Lord, and He shall sustain you. We're going to look at that part now. Genesis 32, verse 1. 
Genesis 32, starting in verse 24. Jacob was left alone. Here he's left alone in the Lord. He sent his family before to meet his brother, sort of a peace offering. He still doesn't know how his brother's going to respond. He hasn't seen him in a long time. They left on bad terms. They separated on bad terms. And he's sending his family before him as a peace offering, so to speak. <clears throat> and Jacob was left alone there in the wilderness. And there, and there he wrestled with a man. Uh, a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the man against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Jacob had an issue. Jacob had a problem. Jacob had a struggle. Jacob had a battle. Jacob had a trial. Jacob had a need. Jacob had an issue, as we do. Okay? Jacob goes into the wilderness, and he's all alone with God. And he's wrestling, as it were, the angel of God. He's getting a hold the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. He's seizing the presence of God. He's seizing the angel of God. And he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And the angel sees that he's not gonna, he's not gonna have victory over Jacob. Right? right. Understand this. The angel sees he's not gonna have victory over Jacob. The presence of God, the angel was sent on behalf, and the presence uh, uh, of God. The angel is not victorious over Jacob. Can that be true? Can that be right? Is the angel more powerful than Jacob? Or was Jacob more powerful than the angel? Um, Jacob is wrestling with the angel. The angel touches him in the hollow of his thigh. The angel realizes, this guy's not letting me go. He's not going to let me go. It's, it's, it's a story, it's a picture of how we need to go in prayer and wrestle with God. That we need to get a hold of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. You can seize it. And those that will seize it will take it. Amen? Uh, anyway, uh, when he saw that he not prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for day breaks. And he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Do you remember the widow... And the unjust judge, how Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven. This was an analogy, it was a picture, a parable of the kingdom of heaven, right? There's an old widow that wanted defense from her enemy. We know it. And she went to the judge, and the judge didn't fear God, the judge didn't fear man. He didn't care. But what happened with that widow? What did she do? How did she act? How did she respond to the judges? Answer. She kept coming back. She kept coming back. No, I won't take no for an answer. You see how Jesus is saying, and how Jacob, when he wrestled with the angel, the angel saw she's not. He's not giving up. Same mindset this woman had that Jesus is speaking of. She uh, she went to the judge. Judge wouldn't give her what she wanted. She went back and she went back because this woman bothers me. I'm going to give her what she's asking for. Right? See, she had victory because she would not let go. It's the same picture that we see in the Old Testament with Jacob right here, where he wouldn't let the, the issue go. He, he was wrestling with the angel of God. He said, I won't let you go until you bless me. How many of you go in your prayer like, God, I'm not getting up until I have an answer. Lord, I'm not letting up on this prayer until you give me victory. I think a lot of times we wear out before that. I think a lot of times we give up. It's so mentally, it's mentally easier to give up and say, well, I guess this, this is the will of God for me to be this way. Instead of us pressing in and wrestling until God gives a victory. And we write it off as, well, I guess this is God's will. When really, we just don't have the will to press in long enough to get blessed. No matter what it is. Honestly, God can do anything, can't he? Amen. He absolutely can. I don't care if it's financial. We've heard testimonies over and over. I don't care if it's health. We've heard testimonies over and over. I don't care if it's a spiritual stronghold. We've heard testimonies over and over. All that God can do. 
The problem is, are we willing to pray and to cast our burdens on the Lord and to press in this way and say, God, until you bless me, I'm, I'm bothering you with this. You told me to come. You knew what you were looking for. You knew what you were asking for because I'm a big project, Lord. I got a lot of baggage, Lord. You know what you're asking, but you told me to come. Here I am. God, deliver me. God, set me free. Lord, direct my path. God, give me understanding. I don't want to be deceived. No matter what it might be, no matter what's burning in your heart, as you bring it before the Lord, you got to come with determination. Lord, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And listen, look at what happened here. These were people that were talked about. There was a lot of people that prayed and gave up. But you know what? The woman... Her testimony was written. The, the widow with the unjust judge, her testimony was talked about, so to speak, the parable, right? And Jacob, his testimony was written. There was a lot of people that prayed. And I'm sure there's a lot more that weren't in here that, that pressed in that way because they trusted God. We need to trust God this way, right? It doesn't matter what it looks like. If it's your marriage, if it's your own heart, if it's a family member, if it's your job, if it's your finances, if it's your past, no matter what it is, God, give me victory. I'm not going to let the devil win over me on this, Lord. I'm not giving in to this temptation again. Lord, give me victory. Wash me, Lord. Purge this desire from me. Bless me. He says, I won't let you go except you bless me, verse 26. And he said unto him, what is your name? Who are you? What's your name? He said Jacob. As if that had anything to do at the moment. Right? But it had something to do at the moment. Because I believe there's a point in every one of our lives that God takes notice of us. Maybe some of you were a basketball coach or football coach or some kind of sports activity. Maybe you uh, experienced this yourself when you were in high school and you played a sport, and the coach said, who is that guy? You were showing exceptional talent, exceptional ability, exceptional diligence in practice and, and in coordination. Whatever the sport might have been, you were, you, were, you were pressing in to be diligent at it, right? You wanted to be good at it. You loved it. You're pressing in. And the coach took notice one day and said, who is that guy? I see how he is, and he's really, he's pressing in. He's sort of rising above the rest of them in, in the way he operates, in the way he plays, in the way he practices. And the scouters, they're called scouters, and they say, who is that guy? Right? I want to have a meeting with you. I want to make a deal with you. This is how it was with Jacob wrestling with God. God, there's a day in every one of our lives, if we press in to know God, that he takes note of us and writes our name down in his book. He takes notice. This guy's looking. I'm going to reveal myself to him or to her because this man, this woman is pressing in to know me. That day has to be for every one of us. So he says, what's your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name shall be no more called Jacob, but his name. It's a day that God gives us a new name. Amen? Because we've just established ourselves in his kingdom. We've just established ourselves in his presence. He knows my name. He knows my name. Amen? You're not standing on the outside. You're not on the outside of the crowd. You pressed in, and he knows my name. And by faith, we're made whole. And we go in peace. We've got the blessing on us. You see the relationship here? So he goes, he said, uh, Thou shalt be no more called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, you have power with God and with men and have prevailed. Look at what happened. All because Jacob meant business with God and he would not let off the issue. He would not let go. He said, Lord, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. And now... He said, uh, and now he says this. As a prince, you have power with God. His establishment in the kingdom of heaven now is, is recognized. Right? He has power with God and with men, and he's, he's prevailed. He's got victory. God gave him victory. 
And Jacob asked him again and said, Tell me, I pray thee thy name. Uh, and, and Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray that uh, I pray thee thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that you uh, that you do ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place uh, Peniel, meaning the face of God, is what it means. He says, For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. See, what happened to Jacob? He cast his burdens on the Lord. The Lord blessed him. The Lord sustained him. And he was not moved. Amen? His life was preserved. He was not moved. He didn't surrender to death. He didn't surrender to weakness. Listen, Christians, we are called to fight a fight. We are called to battle against the flesh. The biggest problem in the church today, the biggest stumbling block in the church today is the flesh. We can't have two masters. We can't walk by the flesh and by the Spirit. We're either submitted to the Spirit of God or we're double-minded and double-minded people don't make it in. Unstable in all your ways. If you feel unstable in all your ways, God wants to, He wants to find you in the wilderness. He wants to find you like He found Moses. He wants to find you like He found Paul. He wants to find you like He found uh, Jacob. He wants to find you like he found John. They got rid of all the busyness, even the friends. They said, I need to get alone with God. I got some work to do. Amen? And they wrestled. And they fought. And they wrestled. And they sought. And they would not, they were relentless to seize the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven suffered violence. And the violent take it by force. The violent seize it. Those that come with, uh, we look at Elijah. He prayed how? Sleepy, half-hearted, and cold? Effectual and fervent. He pressed in. We look at Jesus. He pressed in as our role model. And if, if the rain stopped a lot because of Elijah's prayer, what God can do, this has to change our prayer life. This is what this is all about. God wants us to change our prayer life. Not a sleepy, dead prayer. But press in and press in. It's going to cost you. It's going to even tax your flesh. Your flesh will get tired. Right? Your mind will get weary. Because God wants to teach us to enter in. That we take hold of the kingdom of heaven. And he takes hold of our name. God says, who is this guy that's knocking on my door? Who is this man that's taking hold of my, the hem of my garment? Of this woman? that's determined to touch the hem of my garment. Who is the one that's asking me for power? That they might live, that they might be blessed. Who wants the power of God? I do, Lord. This is why I press in. God, I need your power. I can't live on my own strength. Lord, give me your power. And every one of us, God wants to give us power to overcome the flesh, overcome discouragement, overcome worldliness, overcome loser mentality, overcome all the seductions of this world and the pleasures of life that try to distract us. God wants to draw us up to himself. And he said, now you're going to be a prince in the kingdom of heaven. And what does Jesus say? He said, you're a royal priesthood. A holy nation, the Word of God teaches us, right? You are a royal priesthood. He's speaking of the church. Those that likewise, these men, have pressed in and got hold of the kingdom of, of heaven. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, as the church in the building of Jesus Christ. We are when we come this way. Amen? Listen, this has to be the year that we become doers. We get fed and we get, we get fat and lazy. We've got to start acting on the things that we're hearing. We've got to start acting on the Word. And, and God is going to make a place for us. God is going to bless us. And we'll have power. Do you know what that means? That means that Jacob had God's ear. That means that when Jacob called out, God heard him. Because Jacob learned to press in and get all the kingdom of God. Every one of us, we need to do the same thing. I want to do more and more and more. I, I know. I want more of God. I know I want more of His power. I'm not content yet. Even if I was good yesterday and God used me yesterday, praise God. But that was yesterday. What about today? we got some things coming up. God, clothe me with Your power. Give me wisdom. Prepare my heart. Put Your words in my mouth, Lord. Let the body get on fire. Let the people stand up. 
Rise up in the name of the Lord. Amen? Because God wants to give us victory. Praise God, let's stand. Come on, Ann, right there.